Oh, you sweet. 
My southernisms, so from our families that are not from here, what we say is if they're not feeling well, we say they're feeling puny. Puny. It don't mean they're weak. It means they don't feel good. Amen? So we have some puny folk. Amen? So let's just continue to be much in prayer. Well, I do have a prayer request that I would love to share with you here this morning. Uh, many of you know and remember Sister Shereen Heck. And uh, Sister Shereen, her husband Tim, uh, was acting a little suspiciously yesterday and they had to take him to Morristown Hamlin and have discovered, as far as I know, that he did have a, a, a stroke. Uh, so let's remember Tim Heck this morning, lift the Heck family up in prayer. We also, as I said, have other families that are feeling sick this morning and not well, going through some things, and, and let's lift them up as well. Also, uh, as you see these beautiful flowers, uh, we want to thank uh, Sister Bonnie Rector, amen, for donating these. We thank you. This, these are some flowers from her son's memorial or celebration of life service that we had here yesterday. And we thank you for your love for this family and continued support. Uh, but anyway, some great things. Do you want to make a couple of announcements? Uh, also let you know that for our ladies' ministry, amen, uh, there is a trip planned for you to go to see Shonda Pierce at Higher Ground Baptist Church October the 8th. If you would like to go, wave at a Sister Linda, see Sister Linda, or you can see Sister Dawn Shoemate, uh, or let them know online, or somehow get the word to them that you want to be a part and you want to go. If you look on the crossroad, Crossroads page, we've got a big poster up. Sign or t put your name in there, and we want you to go and enjoy. Shonda Pierce has been uh, a traveling comedian for many years, Christian comedian, loves the Lord, loves the, the laugh, and I'm telling you what, you will enjoy it if you go. Need to go by this Wednesday, if at all possible. Amen. Also, as many of you know, I dropped the ball on a lot of stuff, and I really did this one as well. But this coming Saturday is actually our missions convention, our sectional missions convention. Uh, for those of you that are new and don't know, it, uh, once a year we come together as a church section. And what I mean by section is the Assemblies of God in the state of Tennessee has over 200 churches, about 214 churches. And it's broken up into segments as far as west, east, and, and, and middle. And also in the east, we also have a section or a segment of churches uh, that come together that are geographically close. And we call it a section, and it's the Tri-Cities. So it's from Mountain City to Greenville. And we'll be meeting in Johnson City Saturday. Saturday night at 6, uh, 6.30 to celebrate missions, to have a wonderful meal together. Uh, the cost is uh, $10 only, and I'm telling you what, the pastor who comes and does this owns a catering business at home, and he has always blessed us so amazingly with food. But if you want to go, meet us here at 5 o'clock. Uh, if you can, let us know on Facebook, but meet us here at 5 o'clock, and we'll be leaving for the church at 5 to head that way. You will not be sorry if you get to go. It'll be a blessing. Amen? Amen. All right, let's all stand to our feet, and we want to go before the Lord in prayer together. If you have an unspoken prayer request, let it be known by raising your hand. 
Amen. How many is glad that God sees that and understands? Amen. He already knows. So let's just join him today in prayer. Join him today in celebration and believe God is the God of reward and deliverance into our hearts today. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you today for your goodness and your graciousness. Lord, we just ask you, Lord, as we sing together, God, as we worship together, God, we pray that we will lift you up, and when we lift you up, God, you will be drawn unto us. And I pray today that when we leave here, God, we'll leave here changed and encouraged and blessed and anointed so that we can be who you would have us to be and a reflection of you unto all those we come in contact with. And God, bless these requests and touch them, Lord, those, God, that are so deep and precious, Lord, that only you know about them. So, God, we love you, we honor and praise you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Can we all say amen? amen. Turn around, smile at that neighbor, and welcome somebody to Crossroads Assembly here this morning. Yellow, blue. I didn't even see you holding that when I was like, yeah. well, what, what Blue and yellow. Okay. Is it blue and yellow make green? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, see, give him both, they'll be green. <laughs> Are you on? There you go. Amen. Praise the Lord. How many is glad that we serve a God that loves us even in the midst of struggle? And we can just cry out and say, Lord, hold our hand. Can I hear an amen? amen. All right, let's sing this old hymn here this morning. As I travel through this pilgrim land, there is a friend who walks with me. Leads me safely through the sinking sand. It is the Christ of Calvary. This would be my prayer, dear Lord, each day to help me do the best I can. For I need a light to guide me day and night. Blessed Jesus, hold my hand. Oh, Jesus, hold my hand. I need you. need him this morning. Oh, yes. Through this pilgrim land, protect me by. There's no other friend on whom I can depend. 
place of 
for our prayer team if you'll come at this time amen if you here this morning you say brother Stephen I I want to come for special prayer you know the book of James says if there's any sick among you let them call for the elders of the church let them anoint them with oil and the prayer of faith would heal the sick and if they have any sins they'll be forgiven we said this last Sunday I want to say it again don't wait until everything is perfect in your life before you talk call on the Lord can I hear an amen and there is no magic in this oil. There's no magic. These men are wonderful men of God. But let me tell you something. They're just men like you and I or ladies or humanity. But it's when we decide to turn and cry out to God, this is a, just a, a connection of faith that we're agreeing that God is going to do exceedingly and abundantly above and beyond. Can I hear an amen? So as this wonderful praise team sings that chorus again, if you want to be anointed and prayed for this morning, would you come at this time?
give the Lord a great big hand clap of praise this morning. Amen. God is good and all the time. Amen. You may be seated this morning. Praise the Lord. If you appreciate this praise team, give them a hand this morning. Amen. We're so proud of them. Thankful for them. Amen. And if you have a child and he is between or she is between the ages of five and nine, you get to follow this beautiful lady to Children's Church here this morning. Amen. We have a few youngins. If you young folks are ready for Children's Church, say amen. Amen. There you go. Praise the Lord. Send them on. We're so proud of them. All right. How many ever remembers the old uh, Uncle Sam saying, you know, we want you. You remember that? Well, I do want to encourage you. We want you and your love and ministry in our children's department. Amen. There is room for you to labor. Praise the Lord. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to the book of John chapter 2. As you're turning, let me, let, let's look at this together. And, and uh, we've, been, we've started a sermon series on what did Jesus say. Somehow we believe that if we follow what Jesus said, amen, it will lead us closer to him. So if we follow that, I know the Lord's going to bless us. And last Sunday we talked about the first miracle in Cana. And we know that Jesus left uh, Nazareth on invitation, he and his first five disciples, and they left nine miles north to a little town called Cana. And Cana was where Nathaniel, the apostle Nathaniel, was from. And Nathaniel was the one who actually couldn't believe that anything good could come from a little town, a little obscure place called Nazareth. Can I hear an amen? But we know there in Cana that Jesus performed a miracle that blessed not only the bride, the groom, but all that was in attendance. And Jesus showed himself to fulfill scripture and be the God of more than enough. So we know that there was six barrels, some say 120, some say 137 gallons of wine. And once they tasted the wine, they were never the same. Even the master of the ceremony, who probably had tasted much wine in his day, said this is the best. And we know that if we can just bring folks to Jesus and let them taste of him, they'll know he's the best. Can I hear an amen? And this Sunday, it leads us to a very interesting passage of Scripture and probably one of the most misunderstood events in Jesus' ministry, although we know there's two different episodes like this, but when it seemed like Jesus lost control and got mad and done some stuff in the temple, kicking over money-changing tables and running cattle and running folks out, and we're going to ask God the question why today, and I believe you'll give us a good answer. Can I hear an amen? If you found uh, John chapter 2, would you stand for the ring of the word of God here this morning? And we're going to read just a few verses, verses 13 through 17. And when you have it, say amen. The Bible says, when it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple courts, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and other sitting at the table, exchange, tables exchanging money. So he made a whip out of cords, and he drove, drove them all from the temple courts, both sheep and cattle, and he scattered the coins and the money changers and overturned their tables. To those who sold doves, he said, get these out of here. and Stop turning my father's house into a market. And Jesus' disciples remember that it was written, zeal for, you, for your house will consume me. And I'll preach just a few moments here this morning on hindrances to the spiritual life. Hindrances to the spiritual life. Could you point your hand this way and let's go before the Lord in prayer together. Lord, we thank you today that we've already felt and experienced your mighty touch. And I pray this morning as we listen, as we hear, we'll understand and glean from you even more. That we could be more representatives of you to lead folks to be roads and not roadblocks to people finding you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. And can we all say, Amen. You may be seated this morning. I want to begin the message this morning with a question. Is how can a world be so lost with a God that loves it so much? How can a world be so vile, so lost, with a God that loves them so much? Well, we understand that every time that the Lord has tried to move in your life or my life, there's always been obstacles. There's always been hindrances. Whether in human form or some other form, misunderstandings, there's always been hindrances to us coming to the Lord. 
when we look at this narrative of Jesus turning over the tables, I want you to know there was more than, a, than, than Jesus being angry at cattle or angry at these animals or angry at these sellers. There's a point, a center point, an understanding of the true reason that Jesus got so infuriated. I want you to know that this is the first, but there's another one in the Bible that's very similar, and Jesus actually does this, does this two separate times. We find one in the beginning of his ministry, and then later in the week of, of blessing or the, or, or the Holy Week, when leading up to the crucifixion, Jesus does this again because they did not heed his warning. They didn't heed his listening. In Mark 11, it tells us again about the same thing, and he's cleansing the temple. What is so important that Jesus would try to change a culture that had been going on for so many years? We know that at this time, Jesus had moved his ministry headquarters from Nazareth to all the way to a town called Capernaum. The reason he did that is so heartbreaking. In the Gospels, we find that he moved to Capernaum because in Nazareth, the only thing that they would let him be is Jesus, Joseph's son. The only thing they would recognize him as is Jesus, Mary's illegitimate baby. And the Bible even says that he could do few miracles because of their disbelief. And then Jesus said something so astonishing. He said that a prophet is with honor except in their own country. I find it very amusing that a lot of pastors like myself have moved from somewhere to pastor to where they are now. Because unfortunately, some folks who knew you as you used to be won't let you be who you are. The only thing they want to recognize of you is that buddy who drunk with them, partied with them, done this with them. Oh, they'll never do anything. They've already cast their judgment on you because they know if you can change, that means they can change too. And they're not ready for that speculation. So what do they do? They say all manner of stuff. And then even I've had this happen. Thank God not in my life, but in others. Oh, they're preaching. I'd never go hear them. Simply because they know that if you change and God can help you be somebody different, then make, that puts the pressure on them. Jesus moved this ministry to Capernaum not only because of that, but also Nazareth was just an out-of-the-town place. But Capernaum in its day was actually the centerpiece, the hub of all civilization. Anybody and everybody would go at some point through Capernaum. And so Jesus, moving his ministry there, had a greater and a rich field to touch more lives and more influence than he would have had if he had stayed in Nazareth. How many knows that today some of you have moved for a reason? We don't understand why. Maybe you didn't understand why you moved from Virginia or Kentucky or New York, California. But I believe that God is wanting to do something so awesome that he's gathering like-minded folks together. You see, I don't know about you, but in the last few weeks, I've been very challenged, as I have for almost two years now, watching the news and being in awe of what's happening. And I really try hard. I really try hard to make sure that when we come together, I'm not preaching Fox or MSNBC or something like that, but we stay in the Bible because I believe our answer is not on the news, but it's in the book. But I was watching here the other day, and Tanya ran in and showed me. I, I forget where it was at. It might even have been Portland or, or one of the other countries that's been so afflicted from this anti-religion movement. But they were having a praise and worship service where thousands were attending, lifting up Jesus' name. You see, family, I believe God's not done with us. I read about Solomon and Gomorrah and how that God told that God and Abraham was talking and all of a sudden as they were communicating, it came down to, I believe, ten people. If they be ten righteous, will you spare it? And God said, yes, I'll spare it. And family, I don't know about you, but if you get your face out of the book, of Facebook and into the real book, you'll find out there are thousands upon millions of people who are still crying out for Jesus. And I don't believe if God would spare for ten, he'll still spare us today. Now maybe you're batting down the hatches waiting for Babylon, but I'm not. It may get tough, it may get rough, but we've got a God who's able. But he's led us here. I know it was hard and arduous and you moved and, and maybe everything hasn't been as you originally planned it to be, but you're here for a purpose. You're here for a reason. Jesus moved to Nazareth or from Nazareth to Capernaum for a reason, for ministry, for availability. Was the opportunity for, for sarcasm higher? Yes, but so was the opportunity for ministry. We know when this happened, it was at the time of Passover. It was a time that everybody who was anybody was visiting Jerusalem. The Jews, the Orthodox Jews who believed with no uncertainty were there to celebrate the Passover. 
where that God had spared those of Israel from the Egyptian curse when the death angel came over and they painted the, the blood of lambs or the lamb's blood upon the doorpost and the death angel passed over. They were there to bless God and celebrate his hand of mercy and grace. There was also the proselyte who had come up as a pagan, but now was a Jew, and they were coming in to celebrate. Even that one, like we learned about Philip. You remember Philip and how Philip went to talk about the, to the Ethiopian eunuch? who was, uh, He was a, a manservant, he was, so he was a eunuch, so he couldn't go in and be a proselyte, but he could be a God-fear. Even they themselves were on this journey to come and to celebrate the one and the true God. You see, I believe with all my heart, family, that there are those that are not sitting here in any service this morning, but there's somewhere in their heart they're longing for something else. I've talked to people who have put their faith in a lot of different things, and now they're saying, this doesn't work. There has to be something else. Could it possibly be that the church is to be an answer? The church is supposed to shine a light. Is it possible that God's going to put people in our life that we never dreamed that we would ever see before, but they have a need, but yet God trusts us to give them an answer? But we know when the Lord tries to move, there's always going to be a hindrance. You see, in this day, Jesus would have been going to what's called Herod's temple. Now, there was three main temples at this time. We know that once again, one was Solomon's temple, and that was destroyed and overcame. And, and then we know that there was also another temple back in the days of Ezra that was rebuilt. You remember uh, uh, reading about that, which was Rubabel's temple. But then this was Herod's temple. And in Herod's temple, there were three main courts. And what I mean by courts is I mean segments or sections. There was the court of the Gentiles, which was the outer court at the very entrance way. That everyone had to go in that way. That was the main entrance, but the Gentiles could only go so far. There was the court of Israel, which was a little closer. And then the court of the priests, which is even closer to the, the sacrificial altar. Each with designation about where they were and what status in life they were led them to different closenesses to God. All became limitation, but yet all was a direct avenue unto the Lord. But all of a sudden, Jesus comes on the scene and he hears the bleeding of these animals and he hears the money changing going on. And maybe you say, well, Brother Stephen, what's wrong with money changing? You've got to understand what was going on. In that day, Roman currency to the Jew was considered filthy money because on that Roman coin would have been two things. On one side would have been Caesar's face. And on the flip side of that coin, most time, if there was a back imprintment, would have been one of their deities, one of the Greek or Roman deities. So for them to exchange that in God's temple was unheard of. They could not do it. So they would go to this outer court toward the gate called Beautiful. Heard that one before? The lame man at the gate of Beautiful. Peter and John said, silver and gold have I none. It was that gate because everybody had to go through it. So all of a sudden, these money changers were there, and you would bring your currency, your hard-earned money up, and then you would lay it on that table, and the, the, one of the Levites or one of those, those, those uh, priests would then exchange you your currency for currency that would be accepted in the temple. That sounds like a good theory. But unfortunately, there were those shysters, those who had unholy robes, but was very unholy, who would exchange for less than what it was worth. You see, family, unfortunately, we, money's been a sensitive subject in the church because, unfortunately, some folks have felt like they were more milk than they were fed. Uh, you're quiet now. Let me say it again. There's been some folks that have actually felt like in the church they've been milked more than they've been fed. And, you know, the thing is, if you don't feed, guess what is? No matter how great the animal, they will discontinue and not be able to provide for anything. Jesus was upset because you imagine a new convert, somebody just wanting to know God, and now the first thing they see is corruption. <laughs> Secondly, we see those who were actually selling different animals. And we know if we read in the scripture that those wealthy families could maybe have the, bring the cattle or the sheep. And if you were poor, then you would have the turtle doves or the doves, and you would sell them as a sin sacrifice. There were multiple different sacrifices. But you had to bring something. Coming to God's temple, you could not just come empty-handed because worship isn't worship unless it costs you something. Oh, God's after my money. No, he's after our heart. And he knows if we never give nothing, we're not attached to anything. It's like rot wrecking somebody else's car. Oh, well, it's not my car. I hate that little, 
Hate that little skint place for them, but then let it be your car you're paying for. That's why the Bible says where your heart is or your treasure is, your heart is. It's not that God needed their monies. God wanted their hearts. But they were exchanging. And we know that the, in Mark, we find that they were limped and, and lamed animals, not even worthy for sacrifice. But what they have done is they had made worship easy. It didn't please God's heart. This money changing was, 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 not, was corrupt. And Jesus saw this and could not stand alone and do nothing. Because it's all about souls. It's all about the harvest. So why did he act like that? The Bible says that he grabbed this stick of these cords and, and, he, and he whipped. He didn't whip the men and the women, but he whipped these animals. He got them out and he, he separated. Why did he do that? Because there was a prophecy we find out in the book of Psalms that would plainly say that the zeal of his house, the zeal of God's house would consume him. You may not think God's house is important, but to God it is important. Now we don't have temples like Herod's temple, but we have church buildings. And there's a great movement in a lot of our hearts that said, I don't have to go to church to be a Christian. Not going to church to be a Christian and help you walk with God is like going here to McDonald's to feed your belly, but not eating anything. We never read in Scripture where relationship with God was separated from God's house. We never do. Jesus went to the temple, taught, and preached. We find that the disciples, even after Jesus' resurrection, even after they were considered enemies to the state, still daily went to the temple. It's because in the houses where like-minded people gather together, glean together, learn together, so that when they leave that temple, they can better share what they know. Being self-taught is not too bad. Until there's a standard. If we're self-taught, guess what happens? We normally learn what we want to learn. We're selective in what we read in Scripture. And if it's not important to us, guess what? I don't want to. I'll skip over that. It says what? No, I can't say that. Let me go to the next chapter. So we find out that coming together is important. Is important. But as we come together, we have to know what we're coming to. The Bible says that when Jesus came, he whipped them, he got them out, he, he drove them out. Why? It's because his house, God's house, was supposed to be a place of purity. Jesus says something very different here. Normally, not most times in Scripture, when Jesus talks about Heavenly Father, he says, Our Father. As a matter of fact, when the disciples said, Jesus, teach us to pray, he says, our Father, and teaches that plurality and that, that, that possessiveness. But in this time, he says, my Father. Because at this moment, he was the fulfiller. He was the law incarnate to make sure that they were living what they were supposed to be living and doing. As a matter of fact, in verse 5, 17 of the book of Matthew, Jesus reminds us, although grace is awesome, it doesn't go away with the obligation as a Christian. Jesus says this in Matthew 5, 17. He says, do not think that I've come to abolish the law or the prophets, but I've not come to abolish them to fulfill them. He was the fulfillment of everything. But yet when folks come to the house, God wants him to be, be found, not to be missed. People were coming. Could you imagine being that new convert, that hopeful one, and the only thing that you're found or met with is problem. Here at Crossroads, when you come in, we have somebody hopefully smiling, shaking your hand, unless they're talking to somebody else. Hopefully when you come to Crossroads, you know that you're welcomed here. And there's no big eyes or little U's. We're not cliquish. One of the greatest things that I've heard about this church is there's no clicks in it. And if somebody's mad because they're not included, it's because they didn't hear about it, and that far they didn't get to come. I know there's women's ministry, and guess what? This, this, this concert or this committee, I'm not going because I'm excluded because I'm a feller. And that's okay. Because we'll shoot some guns and we'll exclude you women, and that's okay too. What are you saying, Brother Stephen? I'm just saying that God wants us to come together and there's a place for everyone. And God's zeal for the house was not because it was brick and mortar, but because it's supposed to be the place where people come and find him. We find that Jesus was on the Father's business. For God so loved the world, but it was costing God too many souls to let this continue. They were coming to worship and the only thing that they found was hardship. 
You see, that's where we come in. There's nothing that we can do about tomorrow's problems or, or yesterday's problems, but we've got to be an answer and not more problematic. You may have been hurt by someone who called themselves Christian. Maybe you found this, this issue in your own life, that you came to a church and the only thing that you were met with was limitations, hindrances, and some kind of litmus test. I've heard in our own community, thank God not here, that people were met at the door when they came in the church and saw if a lady had a dress on and a man's clothes were appropriate. That the length of hair was judged, the, the shortness of hair was judged. Let me tell you something, family of faith, none of that has anything to pertain to the Lord. Jesus went and died for all folks. Jesus died for everybody. Let me tell you something. I told Rhonda I wasn't going to use her, but I am again. Amen. Whether you've got pink hair or no hair, you're welcome here. Can I hear an amen? amen. What are you saying, Pastor? We've got to stop being stumbling blocks. I'm so glad that I'm not the cookie cutter for everybody to look like to be a Christian. And somebody just said, thank you, Jesus. Family, maybe that's something you found. Maybe that's something that you, you went. But I want you to know that God did not close his heart or turn his face to your malady. As a matter of fact, we find in Luke 17 that Jesus addresses this hardship. In Luke 17, 1, Jesus says this. He says, Jesus said to his disciples, Things that cause people to stumble are bound to come, but woe to anyone through whom they come. But woe. I want you to know that for every person that has intended or hoped or wanted to come to God's house, woe to them that's been the stumbling block. Woe to them that's been the hindrance. As a matter of fact, Jesus continues to say, it would be better for them to be thrown to the sea with a milestone tied around their neck and, and than to cause one of these little ones to stumble. And Jesus concludes, so watch yourselves. What are you saying, Pastor? Listen, be careful how you talk to one another. One of the greatest things has been Facebook, and one of the worst things has been Facebook. There's been people who have cowered behind that computer and onslaughted all kinds of gro just negativity and slander against everybody because they knew they'd never have to come face to face. But guess what? The world is watching. You can say anything you want to say, and you can think you're validated in doing it. But let me tell you something. If you become a stumbling block to somebody else coming to Christ, so the only thing I'm saying to you and I, be careful. My mama said something. Your mama said something. Her great-grandma said something. I don't even know where it come from, but we need to live our Christian life like it. If you can't say something nice, don't say nothing at all. Unless you're married and you can talk about it just to your wife. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. We Southerners are terrible. I can't talk about you. If we think if we say bless your heart, we can say whatever we want to about them and God's okay with it. Stop it. We got to quit. I know I'm being a little silly today, but family, some of you this morning, you walking through those doors was a challenge because you remember what somebody said to you. We laugh today, but some of you, it may have been a struggle. We think about Membership Sunday, and somebody had told me a long time ago, I'll never be a member again because I was a member and treated like garbage. See, family of faith, that was a hindrance and a block and a, and a stone, but I want you to know God's working on us that we can be a conduit and not some kind of block. We want to be an, a road to Christ, not a roadblock away from Him. Jesus continues to say this. He says in Luke 17, if you all believe Luke's in the Bible... Luke 17 says this, verse 3, So watch, if your brother or sister sins against you, rebuke them. It don't mean go on Facebook and say, boy, they're a jerk. Go to them and say, hey, did you mean what you said? It wasn't too long ago I had a guy who hey, loved him to pieces. He didn't know what he was, I mean, he didn't mean anything by it, but I was offended by what he said. I know I'm jovial and silly, but... Listen, he said that sort of hurt my feelings. And I was like, that didn't sit with me right. So on Monday morning, I picked the phone up and I called and he and I talked about it. And it was a misunderstanding. And I love this brother. I love him. And guess what? We're closer now than we were then. But if the enemy can get you so mad that you won't say anything, it builds up. Oh, I won't say nothing. I'm not talking to them. And guess what? It's like a soda being shook up. 
it builds and it builds until they do that one other thing. Boom! I'm not going back to that church as long as they're there. It's amazing to me. We'll go to Walmart. No, they, they overcharge us. We'll go to Pals again, even if they leave out our tater tots. Come on, somebody. We'll go to work the next day, even if we're cussed out by our boss. But if we're offended at our brother or sister, we'll let it sulk, let it simmer, and just stay at home. God help us. Verse 4 says, even if they sin against you seven times a day, and seven times come back to you and saying, I repent, you must forgive them. And I love the honesty of the disciples. And the apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith. What you're asking me is hard. And family, some being a Christian is not a, always a cakewalk. It's being forgiving even when you want to hit them in the nose. It's acting like and being happy to see someone even like you thought, God, I hoped I wouldn't see them till eternity. But okay, here they are. I was bullied by a kid in school. Only one, believe it or not. Because I'm big, but I, I ne- I'll tell you a secret, I've never been in a fight. I laughed, I joked, and if I made a man, I went the other way. It's a pretty good deal. And I was six foot tall in eighth grade, so my little five foot four buddy got mad at me, but he thought twice before he tried to climb the tree. But I can remember one guy was just, he was awful. Hit me and was mean and everybody, nobody liked the kid. And when he moved away, I was so thankful. The night before, before everything was settled, I'd practice with my dad how to knock him out. I'm being honest with you. I was in fourth grade. I was, my daddy didn't, we didn't have like all the gear, but dad had a baseball mitt. He's like, boy, hit me in the baseball mitt. I'm, Call his name out. Ah, and I'm hitting and hitting. I'm ready. I'm ready. But the next day, with tears in his eyes, he says, I'm sorry, and tries to give me a little rubber ball. I remember his one. I want to stab the ball and crush it and throw it. But he moved away, and I'm like, thank you, Jesus. Until I'm preaching revival 20 years later. And when I'm preaching revival, guess who shows up? He's also a minister. He's also trying to do what's right. What are you saying, Brother Stephen? I'm telling you we got to take care of this because if our brothers and sisters can't get along, the world's thinking, why would I ever want to be like them? Come on. The apostle said, Lord, increase our faith. I'm telling you what, it gets ugly sometimes, but I want you to know the Lord wants you to be a road to the Lord. Be honest. Be open. Don't be cowardly. Be courageous. Don't talk about them behind their back. Go to them in love and say, maybe I misunderstood you, but why? Why did you say that? How did that happen? And I don't get it, and I guarantee you'll find a brother or a sister and no longer an enemy. And if they still won't repent, then just what? Leave them alone. Let the Lord deal with it. He deals with it a whole lot better than you do. I don't want you to call me to get you out of jail because you couldn't talk to them. Come on, somebody. Because guess what? I won't. You see, the Bible says this. He's talking to the disciples and he says, forgive them. The problem is, is we who know better, we need to do better. You ever talk to somebody, why would you do that? I know I shouldn't have done it. Well, why did I? I was emotional. I was supercharged. I wasn't thinking clearly. That's the problem with us. Sometimes we as Pentecostals, if you're not Pentecostal, I'm not talking to you because I don't know. But it's, everything's emotional to us. We'll shout over anything. Come on now. That was good eggs and bacon. Hallelujah. (laughs) And sometimes we respond way too impulsively. And it gets us in trouble. But family, we need to think about what are we doing. And especially if they're a new convert, especially if they're a brother and sister in Christ, remember what Jesus said. It would be better than you to have a milestone hung about your neck. Well, brother, you mean God wants me to forgive them? They're not sorry. That God didn't say forgive them if they're sorry. He said forgive them. Because if you're a stumbling block, guess what? It'd be better for you to have a millstone. You know what a millstone is? They grind, they grind meal. They, grind, they would take the wheat and they would throw the wheat after it was, it was harvested and it was separated. They would take the wheat and put this big meal. Many times it was three and four and five hundred pound stone. And they would buy 
horses or, or by oxen, and they would grind this meal until it became powdered for flour. And Jesus is saying, it would be better for that heavy thing to be on your neck and be cast into the sea than for you to be a stumbling block. Family, we, we've got to grow up, and we've got to let God be God through us. Doesn't mean we have to like it. Like I said, go to them. Go to the Lord. But don't talk bad about your brother and your sister. I want you to know for those that are coming to the Lord, God, that's why he came. He came for the ones that sometimes we don't want. He came for the ones who are lowly of heart. He came for the ones that a lot of times in Christianity, it's funny, but in Christianity sometimes we're the ones that receive folks who don't fit in anywhere else. I mean, think about it. Sometimes folks don't come to the Lord because everything's happy. Sometimes they've reached the end of their rope and there's nothing left and God is their last, last chance. Because somebody told them that the Lord loved them and somebody told them the Lord would accept them and somebody, and the thing is, we've got to pay for the checks we write. If we say the Lord loves you, then let's love them. If we say the Lord will forgive you, then let's forgive them. If we say that there's a place for you in heaven, then let's make them a place here. It's not always easy. God will bless. After Jesus had turned over the tables and had done everything that he had done and, and scattered their flocks and ruined their money for that day, the Jews responded to Jesus in verse 18, chapter 2, verse 18 of the book of John. And he says, what sign can you show us to prove that you have authority to do this? They're putting him to the test. Come on, do something. Because if you're not godly, surely you're going to get you back. And Jesus says something so poignant in verse 19. He says to them, he says, destroy this temple and I'll raise it again in three days. They replied, it's taken 46 years to build this temple. Herod's temple that they were in, they had been building on it for 46 years. And history tells us they still weren't finished with it. And Jesus says, you tear it down, I'll build it in three days. But verse 21 reminds us, as John writes, that the temple that he had spoken of was his body. He wasn't talking about some brick and mortar. He wasn't talking about something that they could see immediately, but he was promising them, there's going to be the day you're going to destroy this. You're going to think you're done with God and me, but I'm going to be raised or resurrected on the third day, and then I will show you more proof than you could ever imagine. You see, family of faith, we can either be like what the Lord would have, or we can be like these Pharisees and Sadducees that are waiting for God to do something big so that we'll act more like him. It's funny but the little rookie in the NBA who sits on the bench who fouled out his first game doesn't have a Nike contract. The NFL star who fumbled his first handoff doesn't have a Wheaties box. And some of us, if we're not careful, we're waiting for God to do that one more big thing before we champion his cause. The family of faith, the same God who may seem meek and humble today, he is coming again. And he's not going to, a crucify, to be crucified on a cross. He will never go to Pilate's hall. He'll never stand before another judgment seat. But he himself, who is judge of all, will come and receive the bride of Christ. And family of faith, I want you to know it's going to be worth serving him for it. Brother Lemmy would come to the piano. I'm going to close here in just a second. We've mislabeled this text so many times in our life. And I'll be honest with you, I have used this text to almost explain away my frustration and anger when I'd hit my nail instead of the right nail and chuck the hammer across the room. And Tanya would go, Why are you acting like that something Jesus would do? <laughs> well, you know, in the Bible, it says he flipped over the tables. Even he got mad. But me not cutting a board ride and him trying to save the temple to be a place of worship. Nah, it sounds like two totally different things. As I'd mentioned before, when Jesus got angry, he wasn't seeing. He wasn't just seeing a temple that was being desecrated by everything else. He saw young Bobby who had heard the conviction of, through the Holy Spirit to go to the temple. And little Bobby couldn't get to him because of everybody else. He got mad because of little Susie who had been in prostitution. Like the woman 
that was brought to Jesus and they told him the law of Moses says to stone her. What do you say we do? He got mad because when Susie went to the temple, the only thing she was confronted with was all she was and in a bunch of malarkey to try to get in. And Jesus says, I'm not having it. Jesus didn't see brick and mortar, but he saw a Roman soldier that one day would say, listen, Jesus, I have a servant who's sick. I've heard you can heal. And Jesus says, do you want me to come to your house? And he says, no. You see, I'm also a man of authority, and I know that if you speak the word, it'll be done. And Jesus knew when this man come to the temple, that he would be so accosted, he might turn around and go home. Jesus so loved you and I that he wanted to make sure that when the church is a church it's a place where people meet Jesus and don't get turned away does everyone stand family I want you to know that we are living in perilous times And the church has been a great place to be divided. I'm afraid sometimes when it comes to our political or our social opinions, and I've been guilty, I've hung them out for everyone to see rather than getting them laundered through the blood of Jesus. Some of you say, well, Brother Stephen, I'm not not allowed an opinion. Of course you are. You're allowed an opinion, and God never tells you how to pray. He just says to pray. And you pray how you feel, and you passionately come before the Lord. And that's you and Daddy time. But what God is saying to us this morning when we come before one another, it's not your job to judge or to make sure someone's the right affiliation. It's for you to lead someone and help someone to come to Jesus. And if they are already with Jesus, it's our responsibility to coax their fears and let them know that we're with them and we're brother and sister. You say, but brother, what if they're Baptist or Meth? I don't care. It doesn't matter. We're the body of Christ. And if it was so important for Jesus to have a place where people could congregate for him, then we have to understand that this has to be a place that we appreciate and we're ready to defend. And we'll defend by being good to folks and we'll defend by loving folks. And if someone starts, tries to start a bunch of malarkey, we'll do what Jesus said and confront them and say, baby, I love you, but not in this house. Can I pray with you? Can you tell me what's really wrong? And I guarantee you'll change a heart. As every head would bow and every eye would close, this morning I just got to ask you, Maybe this morning it was hard to put your clothes on and come to church. Maybe this morning you you made this covenant with the Lord and said, Lord, if they they shun me, I'll never go again. Lord, if they reject me, I'll never go again. And I want you to know today God's working on you and He's working on all of us. So you're not shunned. As a matter of fact, you've been prayed for. You've been wanted. We want to show God's love to you. But secondly, thou, it has to be your responsibility. Because if you came this morning, you were not asked to stand in one court or another or held back to a seat or another, but you've been given access to come to the Lord. And as every head is bowed and every eye is closed, I just got to ask you before you leave this morning, is everything right between you and Jesus? Has there been anything this week that could hinder your prayer time? Is there anything this week that seemingly just not caused you to not want to talk to the Lord or not want to be around Him? Or maybe you've gotten so frustrated that when your songs that you used to praise the Lord with, now when they come on, you get a little skeptical and want to change the station. My brother, my sister, you're here for a purpose, you're here for a reason. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, whether we are first-timers or a thousand and first-timers, God, we don't want to just hear about the church, but you've called us to be the church. 
And God, we can never and will never again try to separate our faith by saying I'm okay by myself because you didn't turn the tables over and run out the cattle and the sheep and the doves simply because of a building but God if we should never God forsake the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is because it is together you are here and it is together we glean and it is together we learn and it is together we grow and God would you please help us to be roads to you and never be roadblocks from you. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Can we say amen? Give the Lord a great big hand clap of praise here this morning.